Hey, Aaron Rabinowitz here for Red Giant TV. In an earlier episode of Red Giant TV, motion graphics designer Owen Street showed us some pretty rad and detailed techniques for creating cool lighting effects with Trapcode 3D Stroke. In this episode, Owen will bring it back to basics with Trapcode Particular. This is definitely more of a beginner tutorial, so if you're new to Particular, this will be a great place to get started. But rest assured, Owen will be introducing you to some of Particular's more advanced features. One thing to watch out for here is the way in which Owen uses After Effects. As always, he uses a ton of great shortcuts and time-saving techniques that taught me a lot. Take it away, Owen! Welcome to this tutorial for Red Giant TV, in which we're going to be looking at Particular. And uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at creating a cloud of particles, and those particles are going to be custom particles, okay? And we're going to be creating a cloud of leaves that are animating through a scene, and in that scene, we're going to include some type, which could be a logo, could be anything you want it to be, and what we're going to do is we're going to sandwich that type between two instances of particular. Now, just to get your head around the kind of thing that we're going to be doing, I'm just going to show you a commercial that I made here in the UK which uses a very similar technique. Okay so as this uh, plays through you'll see that what I did in this commercial was use petals. That was the brief and so I made all these different clouds of petals and they had to be animated in different ways revealed obviously by uh, the character walking through most of the shots or in certain shots like for example this one which I actually I will freeze uh, because this is quite relevant to what we're going to be creating. Uh, in this shot what I've got here is foreground and background versions of particular. So I've got two instances of particular running concurrently and what I did was I rotoscoped out this uh, actress here and obviously these hands as well in order to put her between the two instances of particular and that helps to really bed her into the scene, make it appear as if these petals were moving through the scene when of course obviously they, they weren't. Um, so it's just a little trick uh, but it's quite an interesting one and you can get quite a nice effect out of it. And also you know in this we're using uh, wind and various other techniques to create a bit of motion. Let's have a look at what we've got over here in our project window. First things first, inside the comps folder we've got this example which we've just been looking at and that is playing this TC commercial. It's called TC commercial because it's actually for the Trafford Centre which is uh, a massive shopping centre here in Manchester in, uh, in England. In here we have footage and we've just got some useful elements here, for example, a colour palette, which we just double click here, bring up our footage window, command minus on your keyboard to bring that back to 50%. And I've just basically put together a TIFF file with colours that I think are possibly relevant to use in this sequence. Inside this folder are images of leaves. Now, these are the images we're going to be using as particles inside Particular. If we just go through and take a look at them, hitting command minus to fit them to our window or command plus to increase magnification if we need to you'll see that what we've got are 29 shots that I took on my Canon 450D camera and I've already taken them into Photoshop, I've cut them out and exported them as PNG files which means they keep their transparent backgrounds when imported into After Effects making them easier to use inside Particular. Alright, inside the Precomps folder uh, we've got the leaves particle PC. PC just stands for precomp. That's what I tend to label my precompositions with just to, so I can keep track of what's going on. And we are going to be uh, looking at that very shortly as well. Okay, so let's just close those down for now. So that's basically what we've got. And obviously I'm going to be supplying this project to you so you can uh, just follow along. Now, let's start creating this sequence. First things first, I'm going to hit new composition button here. And I'm just going to call this um, particles. I'm going to make mine 1024 by 576, like so, and I'm going to give it a duration of 125 frames. Now, these settings are all uh, UK settings, they're PAL settings, okay? So if you're doing this in the States or wherever and you want to do different settings, that's absolutely fine. This is basically standard PAL widescreen here, uh, frame rate at 25 frames a second, and obviously at 25 frames a second, 125 frames gives us a little five second sting to work with. Okay, so just hit OK on that. And what I want to do is just create a background first of all. We're just going to create a very simple graphic background. Uh, multiple ways in which to do this. You can either contextually click by right clicking or holding down control on your Mac keyboard and clicking in this empty space here and uh, up comes a contextual menu. Um, some of you may be familiar with contextual menus already. You could also come up to here, layer, new, what we want to do is be creating this solid here, so we could go to layer new solid, or as you probably saw there on that menu, you could do layer solid by 
pressing Command Y on your keyboard. So any of those uh, is absolutely fine. Create yourself a solid, make sure it's the comp size, which this one is, and let's rename this BG for background. As simple as that. OK, so with that selected, we want to create a little gradient here, and I'm going to contextually click this time. Uh, it could come up to effect, but I'm going to just contextually click here in the effect controls window that I've got open. I'm going to scroll down to generate, and I'm going to scroll down again to ramp. Ramp is effectively After Effects's gradient feature. OK, so again, there are multiple ways in which you can adjust this ramp. You, very quickly, you could either you know, move the crosshair by clicking the crosshair uh, button here and then clicking somewhere here or as you can see you can grab the crosshair and move it around live with a live update which I think is probably the best way of doing it or you can dial in numbers here it's entirely up to you but uh, I'm gonna just move them around myself here so I'm gonna take my start of ramp crosshair here and I'm gonna take my end of ramp which is sat down here I'm gonna pull it over to the right here so we've got a, a gradient running all the way across from left uh, top left to bottom right OK, so we're going to bring in um, the first bit of footage uh, that I showed you, which is this colour palette, and we're just going to literally drag that into our scene, like so. And let's scale that down. Hit S on your keyboard, bring up scale, scale that down. The reason I brought that in is so that with our ramp selected, what I can do is I can choose a start of colour, and I can take it from this TIFF file, like so, and I'm going to choose that colour there. And at our end of colour, I can again click on my uh, little eyedropper, I can choose that colour there. And then what I can do is I can just delete that Orton palette TIFF and we've got a nice ramp running through our background like so. I actually probably want to make that end colour a little bit darker. So what I can do is just tap in my colour swatch there and just drop it down towards black just that little bit more. Hit OK on that and maybe just pull that round a little bit. There you go. That's perhaps a little bit nicer. Command minus again something along those lines is fine. Now, very quickly, the reason why I've created a ramp like this in the background, there is a reason for it, there is a bit of design going on through this uh, project, and that is that we are going to ultimately have a light source sat top left off screen, shining down onto our particles, all right? And that's why I've done this, because it's kind of mimicking the idea of some light fall off, which is that the light will be brighter top left, and then as the light kind of dissipates, as you, if you will, um, we move into a kind of a shadow area here. So the light only reaches a certain distance. And some of this will become slightly clearer when you see how we're going to be lighting our particles. But this is just kind of a 2D equivalent, a very quick 2D solution to creating the idea of some, some lighting. OK, so with that done, let's create our next couple of layers. And what we're going to do is we're just going to create some uh, text. So new, contextually click there in the, in the grey area, new text like so and let's type in the word autumn all right so let's, um, let's move that over and by the way actually I've got my character palette open here you can see that the typeface I'm using actually is Gotham uh, it's actually I think Gotham black that um, and that's at 90 point in fact I'm gonna scale that up a little bit I'm gonna make it 110 points something like that a little bit bolder okay and contextually click again uh, new text and I'm going to type the word colors okay and just drop that down and actually I think we're going to make that Gotham rounded and let's just scale that down so that autumn's a little bit bigger let's take that down to 90 point and just the tiniest bit of type design we're just going to arrange the L of colors the center of the first stem of the M of autumn and that's it that's as far as the design is going to go as far as the typography is concerned just center those up in frame like so we may as well choose some colors might we while we're here so again grab our autumn palette bring it over scale it down again to get out of the way like so and I think autumn probably can stay that color but let's make colors something else let's again click our eyedropper and let's choose, oh I don't know, let's keep colours that way actually and let's make autumn uh, this bolder orange. Okay, that will do for now. You can make these any colours you want, in fact you can do, you know, any of this is, is totally editable obviously and totally tweakable to whatever you want to do. So what I want to do actually is I want to continue the theme of some lighting being up here, although we haven't obviously created any lights yet. 
And so one way in which to do that, to add a little bit of the idea of depth to this type without going into a 3D application, is to use layer styles. So after selecting your layer, you can either go up to the layer drop down menu at the top here and select layer styles from there, or we could contextually click on the layer in the timeline. To do that, simply right click on your PC or control click on your Mac to bring up the layer menu and select layer styles. Now navigate to bevel and emboss and let go of the mouse to select it and perfect, the style has been applied. And as you'll see here in our timeline window is a layer styles um, dialog box and bevel and emboss. If you just open up those options, you'll see we've got style technique, depth, etc. Well, let's just increase the depth to say 125%. Uh, let's take the size down a tiny bit and we won't soften it. I think leaving that hard edged on this particular part of the type is fine. And again, can you see what's happening? Um, there's like a glint, if we just zoom in, command plus on the keyboard, you'll see that there's like a little bit of a glint now highlight running on the sort of the left and top edge of this type. And then at the bottom and to the right slightly, uh, the type has been darkened down. So Again, it's a very quick 2D solution to creating the idea that there's some light up here being shone down and hitting these um, these elements, and that's precisely what we want here. Um, I'm relatively happy with that. Uh, again, I'm going to contextually click on colors. I'm going to go up to my layer styles, and I'm going to select bevel and emboss again. And in this particular option, I'm going to increase my depth to 150. I'm going to zoom in again so I can see what I'm doing. And I think, you know, that's... That's pretty nice. I'm going to soften it maybe a little bit, something like that. And that just, I think with this kind of rounded type, actually, it probably works even slightly better. And again, it echoes the lighting, which is um, which is really the key the key point at the moment. So with those done, what we want to do is now pre-compose these uh, these layers. And the reason we want to pre-compose these primarily is because we've used layer styles. I know that shortly in this sequence we're going to be animating a camera really up close towards these. As we move really, really close to the type, what happens is, especially when we, when we have depth of field switched on, which we will be doing, the layer styles kind of freak out a little bit because it's to do with the way um, effects are ordered inside After Effects. And basically, it tries to apply a layer style to the layers after the depth of field uh, uh, has been applied. Well, that's at least how it appears to me when I, when I did a bit of a trial run of this and it just it just looks messy. It just doesn't work. So the best way I think to deal with that is to pre-compose these layers. So quite simply command shift and C to bring up a pre-composed dialog box and what we'll do is we'll just rename this type PC. It's as simple as that. Okay, hit OK on that, and we know we've got that safely stored away. We may as well make that a 3D layer because we know that shortly we're going to be adding a camera and we're going to be wanting this to respond to our camera. We don't, however, want this uh, background layer to respond to the camera, so we're just going to leave that as a 2D layer. So why don't we create a 35mm camera, and why don't we just name it 35mm camera. And of course what I did there was I just control clicked or right click on a PC in order to bring up my contextual menu and go to New camera. Of course you could have gone to the top of the screen and gone to your layer drop down and gone to layer new camera that way or of course use the keyboard shortcut. Hit OK. So now we're going to get into the real meat of the tutorial. So let's create a new solid and let's let's not contextually click this time. Let's use our keyboard shortcut. Let's press Command Y. Command Y brings up our solid settings dialog box and let's name this particles like so and let's color it slightly differently rather than being another black solid let's make it purple purple for particles and let's hit OK on that now in effect controls uh, I'm going to contextually click again and I'm going to bring up our effects menu I'm going to scroll all the way down till I see trap code and I'm going to go across to particular so there we go that's the last we'll see of our purple screen. The reason for that is as soon as you introduce an instance of particular into a solid, the uh, solid becomes effectively transparent and all that is sat on it is whatever particles you create. And to prove the point, if we just scrub down our timeline a little bit, what you will see is the default instance of particular doing its thing. If you've ever introduced particular into a project before, you, I'm sure you'll be uh, familiar with this. What it is is a single point emitter emitting uniformly the default sphere particle so you can see it's going off in all kinds of directions. Now uh, we want to get in and we want to tweak this. We're going to tweak it quite heavily obviously in order to create our, our cloud of leaves. So as I say we've got our particles like so and what we want to do is very quickly get into here and we want to change this whole particle setup. Now particular what it has is it has this kind of 
uh, menu setup where you can actually open up, you can twirl down using these uh, little arrows here, and you can reveal various menu systems within Particular. And I like to keep things neat and tidy if I can and try and not have them all open. If you, for example, were to scroll down and open up all of these different um, settings and you know you're, you're looking for something in particular, you can find that you can get a little bit lost within the menus because it, you know there's a lot of stuff inside uh, Particular and you know it can look a little scary if you allow it to, but it doesn't have to be scary if you just keep it a little bit more contained and this is one of the best ways I think to learn it personally is to start to think well what is it I want to adjust and now this as I say is a point emitter we want this not to be a single point we want this to have depth we want this to have um, some space in the X the Y and the Z so if we open up the emitter settings alright it's may sound like I'm stating the obvious but believe me if you, if you get your head around all of this the way to deal with it then you know you're halfway there open up the emitter setting and you'll see here straight away labeled for you emitter type and it's a point emitter as I mentioned earlier what if we drag that down to be a box emitter like so now did you see these now just keep your eye on these actually when I do that if I go back to point emitter like so they're grayed out and that's because a point doesn't have any depth okay it doesn't have anything in the X the Y and the Z it's just a single point from which all the particles are emitting if you scroll that down to the box or sphere what have you you'll find, bang, they become available, all right? So this can actually have dimension, and that is precisely what we want, because we want a cloud of particles, we want it, have to, uh, it to have some dimension. So I'm going to create a box, and I'm going to create a box that's bigger than our scene. I'm going to create a box that's 1,500 by 1,500 by 1,500, like so. Okay, so what we have now is this box of particles, and uh, as you can see, they're sort of floating around in space, and actually there's uh, none here at the very beginning of the sequence, and as we move forward down the timeline, you'll see they kind of come into life, and then actually some of them come into life, and some of them then disappear again. Um, you'll see if you watch uh, maybe him there, you see where my arrow is pointing just at that particle there? If I scroll back, you'll see he kind of comes into frame, he's come into life, and then he disappears there and there's a reason for that because these particles all have a particular lifespan at the moment and that lifespan is shorter than the duration of our sequence so we need to adjust that you'll also see that they're kind of uh, uniformly kind of animating around screen um, which actually we want to adjust that as well they actually have uh, they, they have some velocity at the moment we want to amend that so you can see there's quite a few settings that we need to amend and all of that is really relatively straightforward. Let's first of all describe what our goal is. Our goal is to create a big cloud of leaves that are just frozen in space and then we'll start to look at what we want to do in terms of animating them through the scene. So we don't want any velocity at the moment so keeping within our emitter setting of the uh, particular dialogue we can see here we've got this velocity, velocity is 100, well let's just take that down to zero. Alright so let's, let's just zero that out and you'll see that okay brilliant we've lost our velocity which means they're all just sat in space but you can see that again they're sort of twinkling on and off a bit like a kind of a, a, a crazy kind of night sky kind of effect and we don't want that so again I mentioned they have a lifespan well yeah they do so um, what we need to do actually is jump out of our emitter uh, settings alright and because now we're talking about each individual particle, each particle has a lifespan, all right? It's not to do with the emitter's lifespan, it's to do with each particle. So we open up the particle settings, all right? And we can see here, yep, it's got a lifespan of uh, three seconds. Well, you know, this whole sequence is only five seconds long, but let's play it safe. Let's make all of them last for 10 seconds, all right? Now, what you should notice is that they all ping on. Yep fine none of them ever die none of them um, ping off again which is precisely what we want but what have we got here we've got another problem and that is of course that we don't have any leaves at the beginning and they all just kind of well sorry they're not leaves at the moment we don't have any particles at the beginning and they just kind of all ping on to frame well we don't want that do we we kind of want this effect don't we want all of these like this right at the beginning of our of our sequence well there's a quick way of uh, of achieving that it's just a little quick workaround and let's just close down particle at the moment and we're talking about the particles being emitted aren't we so again logically we go back to our emitter settings all right and what we can see at the top of emitter we can see that there's uh, 100 particles a second are being created or being emitted so uh, logic tells you doesn't it that um, if you're at zero frames of a sequence 
it's had no seconds from which to create any particles, has it? As, as you go down, by the first second, which is 25 frames, it's had enough time to generate 100 particles. OK, you don't see 100 particles here, but that's because, remember, our emitter size actually goes beyond this screen, so therefore there will be 100 particles created, it's just you can't see them all in the particular window of, uh, of view that we've got. So how do we create a whole bunch of particles really early on in the sequence? Well, what we can do, and this is a classic little trick, is we can keyframe a massive burst of particles. Let's type in 20,000, all right, at the very front there. And we've got a keyframe. And if we hit U now on our keyboard, um, you will see, there we go, particular particles a second, 20,000, there's a keyframe. And just press page down on your keyboard once, like so, to move forward one frame. And what we're going to do is we're going to zero that out at that following frame. And what that basically has done is there are no um, particles on this very first frame, but there's a keyframe saying generate 20,000 particles a second. So by the time it's moved forward one frame, it's generated that many particles, and I think that's going to be enough particles for us. And then after this frame, just don't generate anymore. So as you can see, there we go, we've got our frozen cloud of particles. That's exactly what we wanted. The only issue is that here, if we move Back to the very first frame, we've got no particles at all. Well, what's the easy way to deal with that? The easy way to deal with that is just to uh, maybe grab the tail of this layer, pull it forward one frame, and just drop it back so that this, this zero out uh, keyframe, is actually on the first frame of our sequence. And Particulate is clever enough, or After Effects is clever enough, to realize that this keyframe here that you can still just about see, because we're fully zoomed out on our timeline, this keyframe is still doing something. Particular has generated, if effectively, it's generated all these particles you know, before our timeline has started. All right, it's clever enough to understand that, that it needs to do that, and that's just perfect. So we've got our cloud, and all we need to do actually is, down the end, again, extend that out by uh, by a frame, because obviously we moved it back one frame, need to extend it out by one frame so it reaches the end of our sequence. That's how we set up our frozen cloud of particles. Now let's get into one of the more exciting parts of this, and that is to replace all of these um, default sphere particles. By the way, let me, let me just show you where it tells you that, um, because this is going to be particularly relevant to us. Uh, if you look inside the particle section here, you'll see that particle type is sphere. That's the default particle that the particular always uh, starts with. OK, so let's move across to our project panel now. I've created a pre-comp, if we just open this up, called Leaves Particle PC. If we just click on that once, you'll see up here in the project uh, information panel that it's 150 pixels by 150 pixels and it's 29 frames long. Now, let's just double-click that and let's take a look at what it is. Well, what this is, is all of those leaves that I showed you earlier sequenced in a pre-composition so that they exist for one frame and one frame only, and they are literally sequenced like this, and it's very, very easy to do this. If you were to import your own stills that you want to use as particles, all you need to do is import them all as stills like this, select the first one, shift-click to select the last one, get, get hold of them, drag them down to your new composition icon, choose single composition, choose sequence layers, and make sure your still duration is at one. And if you hit OK to that, and let's just command minus out so we can see that properly. There we go, sequenced are all our layers. Now I've taken it a little a stage further. What I've done is I've, I've reduced the size of it, all right, to 150 by 150, uh, like so. And in order to fit them in, you just c click one of them, command A to select them all. And if you contextually click on these, you will find there's a useful little um, contextual menu comes up, transform, fit to comp. Like that. There's actually a keyboard shortcut as well, but I thought I'd show you where that is in the menu system. If you do fit to comp and you've selected them all, all of them will be very neatly fitted into our composition size, which is yeah, precisely what we want. Now, like I say, I've taken things a little bit further. Let's uh, command plus into that. Uh, you'll see that actually some of these were shot at a slightly different distance, or the leaves were slightly smaller than others. Um, so actually that as a particle perhaps is a little bit small compared to uh, that one. So I went through and I altered each one individually, and if we just close this out actually for now, because we don't need it, this example was just to show you, I'm going to get rid of that for now, I'm going to close my leaves folder up, I'm going to show you the pre-composition that I have pre-prepared. You'll notice that they've actually also all been made into 3D layers, which is just by clicking on uh, this icon here, and I have rotated them all slightly. 
in 3D space to add a little bit of extra dimension to them because with this kind of uh, work, this kind of particular work, I think that variety is a strength and especially when it's something organic like leaves. So if we scroll through, you'll see that I've scaled them up and I've kind of added a little bit of extra dimension to them. Okay, uh, it just adds a little bit of interest. Bear in mind, the reason I've made this composition just 150 by 150 pixels is that Particular doesn't like unnecessarily large particles, as that can slow it down. And of course, just to be clear, this composition will be what Particular looks at in order to generate its custom particles. So this could be whatever you want it to be. It could be typography, it could be um, some photographs you've taken, it could be some illustrations that you've done, it, anything you want it to be. You could create your own pre-composition and get Particular to look at that and generate particles from that. Or how do we do that? Really, really simple, I'll show you. Let's jump across to Particles again and let's grab our pre-composition. Let's drop, drop it into our comp like so. We can drop it into uh, underneath everything because we don't actually need to see that. In fact, you can even turn its visibility icon off because the way we're going to see those leaves is via Particular. Okay, let's click on our Particles layer and with uh, Particle still open here, if it isn't, just twirl it open, you will see uh, the section I was talking about, Particle Type, is currently on Sphere. Uh, if you drop that down to Sprite, okay, what you'll notice is all of those spheres disappear. All right, we've got a blank canvas, right? Don't worry, that's, that's absolutely what should happen. If we then open up texture under layer, if we choose our leaves particle PC or whatever pre-composition you've chosen, and we move over a point in time at which this leaves particle PC exists, you will see that those spheres have all been replaced with quite small versions of the leaves. Let's have a look at increasing the size here because they are too small at the moment. Let's take that from 5 up to 25. Okay, and let's zoom in, Command Plus on our keyboard. And there you go, you can see that all of those spheres have been replaced with leaves. And as we move through the timeline, frame by frame, we will notice that Particular is using a single leaf to create all of our particles. There is, of course, some simple logic to this. If we double click on our pre-comp and take a look, and then go back to our main composition, we will notice that whatever is on the current frame of the pre-comp is being used exclusively by Particular to create its particles. Then if we move forward another frame, double click on our pre-comp again to see what leaf is there now, then go back to our main composition, we will see the particulars now using what is on that current frame to create our particles and so on and so forth. This will carry on sequentially until the pre-comp runs out of frames, which would be frame 29 in this case. And the reason for this is the way Particular is referencing our pre-composition. So if we go back up to our Particular settings and take a look, we will see that just underneath the texture layer option, there is another option called time sampling. You will notice that it says current time, and this is pretty self-explanatory in that it tells us Particular will use whatever is on the current frame of the pre-comp and use that to create all the particles for that frame. We want to amend this and get a more random distribution of leaves across our scene. Now if you drop that down to random still frame, okay, Let's just open this up a little bit. Let's just, uh, in fact, actually, no, let's just zoom out a bit. There we go. Look at that. That is far more what we want, isn't it? What we've now got, and just to kind of explain this to you a little bit more, what we've got is we've got Particular looking at this pre-composition, which is 29 frames long, and it's now looking at a random frame for each individual particle. So if you had maybe 50 fr uh, frames in this pre-composition, it would look across all 50 frames and randomly place what's on those frames across all of the particles that it's generated. So in this instance, it's, it's able to look at 29 different frames and distributing those 29 unique frames across all of the uh, particles it's generated. Of course, you will still have some repetition because there's far more particles being generated than there are frames to be distributed. But what you are getting now is a far more organic feeling, random cloud of particles. What we can now do with this is start to add some uh, dynamism to this and start getting into some really cool effects that are sat within Particular. So we're sort of done with the emitter for now, we're done with Particle for now, We may, maybe we'll revisit them shortly, but uh, for now what we want to do is we want to get into the physics section of Particular. Now, you know the word physics sounds a little bit scary, uh, I, know, I know I wasn't particularly good at all that sort of stuff myself, but don't worry about it, it's far more friendly than you think. Um, if you open up your physics here, you'll see the physics model is air. There's only two options, air and bounce. Today, we are looking at air, okay? And because we're looking at air, this uh, option is available to us here. Twirl the arrow open. Now, when you first see this, it 
can look a little bit scary, but really don't don't worry about it. We're only going to be amending a couple of these um, options here, and you know most of it's reasonably self-explanatory. For example, we want these particles to move across the face of this type, or at least I want them to, and you know uh, so that's what we're going to do. Um, and the easiest way to do this really is uh, see here you've got wind x, y, and z. Well, basically it kind of does what it says there. If you apply um, a, a value to wind x, it will basically blow the particles in the x. So it will blow the particles across our screen from left to right, as it happens, um, unless you were to go into negative figures, obviously, and then we go from right to left. But we're going to go in positive figures, we're going to go from left to right, I think that's going to look nicer, and I'm going to dial in uh, a wind setting of 75. You'll see they jump across because we've um, we sat down the timeline here. Um, the way that these settings work, actually, is rather than um, keyframing it in the way you would normally do with positional data, so you would keyframe something at, say, uh, an X value of 0, and then you would keyframe further down the timeline at an X value of, say, 250, and then it would move between 0 and 250. You don't need to keyframe the wind here. You can do to create different effects, but you don't need to, because as soon as you've dialed a value up, it will apply that over time. So as you scroll across the timeline, there we go, it's applying that 75 value over time so our leaves are being blown across the screen so it's kind of generating animation for us um, for free effectively and you know that's just a really nice and easy way to get our particles animating across the screen now hopefully you're picking up on a couple of things here which is that you're getting a really nice um, sense of parallax where leaves some leaves are passing in front of others some are further away from the camera obviously some are closer so you're getting that parallax effect which just really helps to create that kind of idea of a 3d scene so you know we're beginning to get some really nice results okay so that's applied there and why don't we add a little bit of spin amplitude to it as well? And what that does is it's just going to add a little bit of jostle to the leaves. And again, we're going to try and create some kind of real world effects on this project. And uh, so if we type in something like 75, and uh, let's see what that does. Okay, there we go. We're getting this nice kind of jostling feeling, each, each particle moving, each leaf moving kind of independently from its neighbor and randomly as well. In fact, let's take that down again to say 50. I think 50 is a little bit more of a sensible uh, amount for that, so I think that's looking really nice. And what we want to do actually is add a little bit more uh, randomness by opening up our Turbulence Field option. Now, Turbulence Field is essentially a bit like Fractal Noise, if you've ever used that at all. If you haven't, don't worry about these slightly complex sounding names. It's actually a very simple thing to use. It is basically a customizable noise pattern or field which Particular generates behind the scenes and you can use it to influence the size and the position of your particles. What we actually need to do is just dial up some effect position here and you'll see that the um, leaves are kind of just being pushed around a little bit. Just dial in something like 45 and again let's have a little look at how and yeah great you know that they're really beginning to pick up this kind of feeling of randomness, which which I really, really like. Like as if some are on an updraft, some are getting blown down, so, you know, towards camera a little bit, away from camera. It's starting to look really interesting. Um, so actually now I think we are done with the uh, physics section. So let's close that up. Let's keep things neat. Let's close up air. Let's close up uh, physics. And what I want is I want each individual particle to have a little bit of rotation. So, you know, again, logic tells us we want to go to the particle section in particular. So let's open that up. And here we have a rotation option, so if we open that up as well, you'll see that we've got a rotate in Z. Now you can just apply a, a general rotate in Z, but do you see that each one is rotating, although of course they're in they're all at sort of slightly different angles because of the way the photographs were taken and everything, uh, you'll see they're all rotating the same amount. So actually, maybe that's not what we want. What we actually want is this, let me just pull this box open so you can see what they say. We want random rotation. Okay, now why don't we type in a random rotation of 15, something like that. You see it's, they've all been offset slightly differently. And that's great because what it means is if you've got a repetition of, say, this leaf here, you know, somewhere else in the, uh, in the composition, then hopefully it's going to be rotated at a different angle, so therefore it will look more like a different leaf, which is kind of the look we're, we're trying to, to get here. What we can do as well is we can add a bit of random speed rotation to everything, and why don't we just type in quite a small amount, something like 0.2, because believe me, these figures, you don't need a lot. A lot goes um, goes a long way. And let's type maybe 
maybe 0.2 into this one as well, which is going to be enough. Um, in fact, it's probably time, isn't it, that we actually hit a preview on here. So I'm going to hit zero on my numerical keypad, and uh, I'll see you in just a second. That's our cloud of particles at the moment, you know. Um, perhaps we could tweak them a little bit. Perhaps uh, they could have a little bit less. Uh, for some reason, that leaf seems to have a bit of a kick in it, and I'm not entirely sure why at the moment, because everything should be happening relatively smoothly, but it's probably just a few random factors just kicking in at the same time. So, you know, please feel free to uh, to come in and, you know, open up things like the... Um, like the physics section again and tweak it until you're, until you're happy with uh, the setting that you're getting. I'm going to reduce the spin amplitude down actually a little bit. I'm going to increase the wind um, up to say 100. Maybe actually have a look at the turbulence field and yeah, maybe take the complexity down to 2. Let's see if that's still got that kick to it. Again, let's do another quick preview. Zero on our numerical keypad and again I'll see you in a second. And I think you'll agree that looks a lot smoother there, doesn't it? Um, I'm a lot happier with that. But there is another little problem that has uh, appeared here, and uh, some of you may well have noticed that because the leaves are being blown across in the x-axis and they're travelling across uh, the screen, the scene, as we um, as we wanted them to, what you'll notice here on the left-hand side here is it actually starts to thin out, and that's because, of course, we've created a, a sort of a finite-sized cloud of particles in our 1,500 by 1,500 by 1,500 uh, emitter, and all those leaves are being blown across the screen, and actually it's running out of leaves. So um, one of the ways to get around that would be to either increase the size of the uh, emitter or to blow it across the screen less with the with the wind setting. Um, I'm actually going to go for the former. I'm going to increase the size of the box emitter. So again, if you recall, that's in the emitter settings, quite uh, hopefully fairly obviously. And what we're going to do is we are just going to go down to our emitter size X here, and we're just going to scale that up until on our last frame we are happy that there is enough particles And what that's done is it's actually reduced the density of particles uh, through the scene because, of course, we've expanded the size of the emitter. And so that means that there's more space in which these particles need to be distributed, and so therefore it's slightly thinned it out. Now, if you want to, you can go ahead and increase the amount of particles. And the way in which you would do that, of course, is you would go all the way back to the beginning uh, of your scene here, uh, press U uh, after you've selected the particles layer to reveal its keyframes, and of course you've got the particles a second keyframes here, just these two. And if you've zoomed right out of your timeline, you should still be able to see them like this. And you can just about click here on this keyframe. And if you just double click keyframes, what it does is it actually brings up a, a value dialog box like this. And what you can do is you can literally just type in maybe, I don't know, 25,000, something like that. Hit OK. And there we go, it's just added a few more particles in. You can do that if you want. You don't have to do that, of course. It's entirely up to you. Uh, you know, at this point, it really is at your discretion you know, how many particles you want to be in the scene. And the way in which you adjust that, of course, is by adjusting this first keyframe here. It's really as simple as that. OK, so I want to do one more general alteration to this whole scene of particles here. And I want to go into another part of the particular dialogue, which we've not yet looked at. And so if we just close down our emitter section of the particular dialogue menu here, and if we have a look at this one, which we've not yet looked at, which is World Transform, we open that up. And what you've got here is basically you've just got these six settings and they pretty much do um, as, as you would expect really with a name like World Transform. What they do, they transform, i.e. they either rotate or they move, they offset the entire world of particles, so the entire scene of particles. So very simply, let's find which rotation we want and I think we want this. We want the X rotation because what I want, what I want to kind of get across, is um, the idea that these are caught in, uh, obviously in wind. They're being blown, and you know when you see leaves uh, on the street and they've been picked up by the wind, they're kind of swirling. Well, I, I want to kind of indicate that a little bit more. So I'm going to set a keyframe here at the beginning uh, with zero X rotation. I'm going to go all the way down to the end of my sequence. And by the way, you don't have to scrub here like this. What you can do is you can press the end key on your keyboard and you can press the home key on your keyboard to get to the beginning and the end of your sequence like so. And then what I want to do is I just want to dial in not a massive amount, but you know a certain amount of X rotation. Let's say something like 25 degrees. And let's have a look now at that 
let's see if we just scrub do you see how they've all got that see that to me adds just that extra little bit of reality i suppose to it and you know I'm, I'm i'm really happy with that but again this is this is up to you how much you want to adjust that by you you can add it in or not as the, as you see fit in your particular project okay so let's close down the world transform section okay and what we actually want to do now is start adjusting the look and the feel of the scene and so what we're going to do is we're going to get into doing some lighting uh, now, very simply, we can either go up to Layer here, New, and we can create here New Light. There's actually a key combination here, shortcut combination if you wish. Or, again, you can Control click on your Mac or right click uh, on your Mac or your PC. Uh, and you can get your contextual menu up and you can go to New Light, like so. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is we want to if, if this isn't on Spotlight, we want to change that to Spotlight. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to name this Spotlight. And the reason I'm going to name it is because we're actually going to have uh, two lights. And anyway, it's just a good good practice to, uh, to name layers as much as you possibly can, just so you know what's going on. And you're going to notice that the only thing currently affected by this light is our 3D type layer. And the type is actually the one thing that we don't want to be affected by the light in this project. So what we're going to do is we're going to come down to our type layer, we're going to select it, and we're going to hit AA on our keyboard. So basically hit the key A quickly in succession, like so, and that opens up your material options. And very simply, what we're going to do is we're going to go to where it says accept lights, and we're going to click on the, uh, obviously it says on at the moment, we're going to click on that, and we switch it off. And there we go, it's returned our type back to the colours that we've chosen, and uh, I'm happy with that. Okay, now why isn't our particle, or sorry, why aren't our particles being lit by our light? Well, the reason for that is because inside particular we have yet another setting, and you know, probably quite logically, you'll have a look at here, uh, these various menu options, you'll see the word shading, and and yep, you've guessed it, that's the one we want. So if you open shading up, very simply, it's um, off at the moment, and all we want to do is we want to switch it on. Now, you'll notice that it has some settings here which might look a little bit confusing, but don't worry, they're not too intense. Um, we've got this option here, light fall off, and at the moment that is selected by default at natural lux. You've only got two options, you've got none AE, or you've got natural lux. Now, we want to use natural lux, and light fall off, nominal distance, all this stuff. What, what, what does this mean? Well, in simple terms, what's happening is the light is uh, emitting light, which is hitting our particles, and that light is kind of distributed um, up to a certain sort of distance. Okay, so the fall off, okay, is where you can see this leaf here is very bright because it's closer to the light and you can see that these leaves further off to the distance are darker because they're further away from the light and that effectively um, is controlled by this nominal distance okay so the light falls off across a distance that you have selected okay so if I dial up nominal distance you'll see you'll see what I mean okay do you see how um, the leaves uh, are now getting brighter and in fact actually the, the one closest to the light here that's getting really really over bright I mean that's that's you know, peaked out at pure white there, and that, that's not the effect we want. Um, so let's let's take nominal distance back down to 250 for the moment. But what we want to do, um, if you remember, back in the uh, beginning of this tutorial, I talked about how we'd set up this gradient, and of course actually the beveling on the type here, uh, in order to indicate that there's a light up here, top left, off camera, lighting our scene. Well, okay, we've created our light now, so what we want to do, uh, let's press Command minus, we've selected our spotlight, hit P for position, and what we're going to do is we're just going to scrub our light into a kind of a, a sensible place to suit the scene that we've built. Alright, so here we go, up top left like so, but actually what I want to do as well is I want to pull it back in Z space, um, so that it's actually it's actually kind of aiming in into our scene, sort of pointing slightly at our particles and actually also slightly above and, and to the left. Okay, so let's pull it back further, further, further like so. And you'll notice that because we've pulled our light away from the scene, that our leaves are now virtually unlit. So again, what we need to do is come back to our shading options and we need to increase our nominal distance. Now as we, as we do so, you'll notice, here we go. Okay, that's great. This leaf actually is in darkness still, so perhaps we need to pull our, pull our light further back. There we go, that's now uh, being lit. And the reason... Sorry, I didn't mean to select the light there. Uh, there we go, we're back to particles. The reason um, I like using this natural lux option of the light fall off is 
because it it does it does what it says it falls off across the scene and if we just dial up nominal distance maybe a little bit more okay what we've got i think is a really really nice effect where these leaves are brighter because they're closer to the light source and these leaves are darker because they're further away from the light source and i just think it adds a really nice natural feel to the scene what you also have here as well as this nominal distance if you want to adjust the brightness of the scene you have two settings you have your ambient and you have diffuse now a spotlight or i think a parallel light or what have you that will come under the diffuse option and what you can actually do is rather than um if we just double click our light here rather than messing around with the intensity of um the light here which is what you would normally do to affect the brightness of the light uh, being cast in a scene let's cancel that instead of adjusting it there what you can do is you can globally affect all of your lights that you've uh, created inside the particular dialog shading option uh, which is great and this spotlight comes under the diffuse option and so if you increase that guess what yeah you, you get more brightness and if you decrease it of course it becomes darker so it's a really nice useful way to be able to um, alter your lighting actually within the particular dialogue now you also have here this ambient option now I think I am going to create an ambient light because perhaps some of these leaves you might feel are slightly too dark. I, I don't want to mess about with our nominal distance and diffuse settings anymore. I'm quite happy with the way these are working. But maybe some of these leaves over here just want to be, uh, just want to have a little bit more light applied to them. You know, perhaps it's not quite realistic that if you had a, you know, sunshine coming uh, over from the top left or whatever, these would be in total, not total darkness, but as dark as they are. So let's contextually click again go up to new, create new uh, light, and what we're going to do is we're going to create an ambient light. Again, you can leave the intensity at 100% because we're going to adjust the intensity options here in the dialog box in particular. By the way, something I should have mentioned previously when I created the spotlight, and you'll notice perhaps here again, the colour, I've actually chosen a slightly warm colour, again, going with the design of the scene, I'm choosing a kind of a warm autumnal type of colour to actually use for my lighting and that's something you can use to create a certain feel mood in your scene you can actually choose to use cool lighting or warm lighting depending on what you want you can choose any color and that will tint the light and therefore that will then tint what is being lit with that color that you choose so i'm, I'm happy with this color anyway i think it's going to suit the scene let's hit okay on that and you'll notice that that's just kind of given the rest of the leaves here uh, it's everything's actually been affected by the um, by this ambient light uh, which by the way I should have named um, I'm going to do that now just so we know where we are okay that's our ambient light and maybe maybe it's a little bit too much maybe we can take our ambient lighting down to say 15 Okay, I'm quite happy with that. I like the way we've got a little bit of uh, brightness on these closer leaves here, but I also like the way that these haven't gone into complete sort of darkness here. Everything's got a little bit of lighting applied to it. I'm really happy with that scene now. Okay, so we are really getting there now. We're, we're nearly at the end, I think, of the tutorial, but what I've left till, um, till the end is perhaps one of the slightly trickier um, sort of parts to get your head around, although don't, don't worry, it's not... It's not too crazy, this. What we're going to do, we're going to create two instances of our particles. Okay, if you remember back at the beginning, I showed you that commercial that I'd made, and I talked about how there was some background particles and some foreground particles, and how I'd sandwiched the actress by rotoscoping her out. I'd sandwiched her between those two uh, particle layers in order to make it really feel like she was sat in the scene. Well, we're going to do a similar thing with our type here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to name this layer here particles... Uh, front. Actually, I'm not. I'm going to name the particles near, and there's a reason for that. It will help you perhaps uh, see what it is we're doing in just a moment. I'm going to duplicate that layer by pressing Command D, and I'm going to drop that underneath my type layer, and I'm going to call that layer particles far. Okay. Now, what I want you to do is just solo this particles near layer, like so. All right. So we're just looking at this particles. Remember, this is just this particle's far at the moment is an exact duplication of this layer here. All right, at the moment they're exactly the same thing. What we're going to do is we're going to alter the visibility of some of these particles so that what we have are only the nearest particles to the camera visible in this layer, and we're just going to have the farthest particles from the camera visible in this layer. Okay, and how do you do that? Well, don't worry, you don't have to get in there and start rotoscoping all of these different things out or painting them out or getting into some crazy kind of workload. It's, uh, it's quite simple to do inside Particular itself. And 
you know, logically again, if you look at the particular menu system, what we have here is a visibility option. If you open that up, what you have is something, again, can look a little confusing at first. Don't worry, we're not going to look at all of these settings, okay? We don't need to. The only settings we need to look at are this far vanish, far start fade, near start fade, and near vanish. Now, again, the clue is kind of in the name here, all right? What this is, this is the vanishing point for the particles that are farthest away. Now, what that means is at 20,000 pixels, I believe, from the camera, all right, and this is, this is actually where it takes its measurement from. It takes its measurement from the, the camera uh, lens, if you like. How far away would the particles vanish? How far away do they have to get from the camera before they vanish? And at the moment, 20,000 pixels, you, you probably, you know, you wouldn't even notice them vanishing. I think they've become so small by the time they've reached that distance. So what happens if you bring that measurement down? Well, at first, if you've ever messed around with this, you might have thought, well, nothing happens. Well, you just keep going and have some patience. And what you'll find is when we get to around about the kind of 2,000-ish, here we go, I expect to see it, and it, there we go. What happens is you're bringing the point at which the particles vanish closer and closer to the camera, okay? So if you keep going, oh, maybe hold down command to um, kind of, you know, slow the scrolling of those figures down a bit. Let's say something like, I don't know, let's say 700, all right? What we're saying now is that at 700 pixels away from the camera, any particles that reach a, a further distance than 700 away from the camera will disappear. So all we're left with are the closest particles. Now this fast start fade, what that means is if we dial in, say, a slightly lower figure than 700, say 600, you'll see that what's happening is at 600 pixels from the camera, these leaves are starting to fade away until they reach the vanishing point. Now, as it happens in this instance, I don't want um, them to fade. I just want them to vanish at that point, at 700, let's say, for now. OK, so there we go. Quite simply, we've created our nearest particles. Now, what, of course, we want underneath, because we're creating a little sandwich here. If you imagine this is our top layer of bread, all right, the type is our filling, and this particles far is our kind of our lowest piece of bread in the sandwich that we're making. These need to be the exact opposite of these particles, as in we need to be showing all the rest of the particles in this layer. And so what we need to do is take this measurement of 700, all right, and very simply we go across to our particles far layer, open up visibility, and instead of the far vanish and far start fade being 700, we want the near start fade and the near vanish to be 700. And just to prove the point, let's unsolo our near layer, let's solo our far layer, and let's type in 700 here and 700 here. So do you see what's happened? What's happened is, of course, it's removed anything that's nearer to the camera than 700 pixels, okay? So we've created a perfect sandwich of our father's particles and 700 away there, and our nearer than 700 particles here. And if we add them together, we have our scene perfectly spliced at this 700 pixel point, all right, perfectly spliced together. And if we switch our type on, what we will find is, do you see here, let's just scroll forward a bit until, we, do you see what's happening? We have now got all of these particles sat perfectly behind our type layer and all of these nearest particles in front. So we've created a far more believable scene. Our type is sat in the scene really nicely. However, we want to do a camera move through this scene. And by doing a camera move, we do open up a little bit of a gotcha because these settings do correspond to where the camera is. So as we move the camera through the scene, the particles that are nearer and farther to the camera change and it can create a little bit of an issue. There is a workaround to that and I am proposing to do another tutorial in which I discuss that because it is, to be fair, a little bit more of an advanced setting. But, you know, let's add a little camera move in because we, you know, we have created our camera. Um, so let's go back to the beginning of our scene here. Let's hit P for position and let's keyframe it. And if we go up to our scene here, we press C to cycle through our camera uh, tools. Press it again, press it again, press it again. And here we go, we've got our, our zoom tool. Let's zoom because, you know, I, I want to do this because I really want to show off Particular's ability to uh, really, you know, fly through this this scene here. And, and I, I just love the way the particles, you know, show off their kind of relationship in 3D space. Let's set a keyframe where we're zoomed all the way in front of the type here. Let's go to the end of our scene. And what we're going to do is we're going to control click on position and we're going to hit reset. And that's 
that's great that's lovely and what we've got is this really nice move here through the scene okay I'm really happy with that but you'll notice this is the this is the sort of gotcha that I'm talking about some of these particles that should be further away because we've zoomed our camera towards these particles they're now closer to the camera than they were so therefore they've popped into our near layer here okay now don't, don't worry if you don't get your head around that at the moment what we're going to do is a quick workaround which is this we're going to get our type player and uh, quite simply at 70 frames if we hit T to reveal opacity we are going to mix our type down and at 100 here which actually I think I think let's say we don't want our camera to to be moving all the way through the scene let's give ourselves a second hold at the end here let's move our camera position keyframe to 100 frames okay and actually while we're at it let's also press um, shift F9 and what that does is that creates an easy ease keyframe which just buffers our, our camera move it just slows it down to just create a little bit of reality to the camera move which I think definitely definitely adds to um, to the to the feel of the piece and what we're going to do is we're going to mix our type layer up to 100% at that same keyframe point there at frame 100 okay and what we've got here is a lovely move back like this really showing off those particles that we've created and then at the end here we've got our autumn layer mixing up and you haven't got any sort of confusion between um, these nearer and further particles uh, having a kind of a, a, an issue as we move the camera through the scene. All right. It's a little bit of a cheeky workaround, but, you know, I think for this tutorial, it's the appropriate thing to do. OK, we really are very, very nearly there. All we're going to do now is we're going to add a little bit of grading to this scene. We're going to add some motion blur. We're going to add some depth of field and then we're going to call it a day. So let's let's move forward and let's double click camera. And we're going to bring up these camera settings again and quite simply let's enable depth of field and let's hit OK. And what you'll notice here, you see how this uh, leaf's a little bit out of focus, OK? Um, uh, I'm quite happy with how that's looking. In fact, actually I want, to, I want, I want more, I want more than that. So let's uh, double click our camera again, all right? And let's increase our blur level to say 150, OK? Yeah, that's created a really nice depth of field to uh, to the scene you see these see these as they come in really nice bit of depth of field to those uh, to those leaves there just adds a little bit extra to our scene I'm really happy with that okay I think that will do for now and what we can also do uh, is we can add a little bit of motion blur to our scene as well why don't we do that because everything's on the move isn't it and so let's select our sort of global motion blur icon up here and then what we'll do is we'll select oh, sorry that's not the motion blur button is it motion blur is here let's select our motion blur icon for our appropriate layers which are our type and our particles because although remember we're not animating our type in that we're not um, we're animating just the opacity we're not moving it but we're moving the camera so there will be some motion blur applied to that type subtle probably but it will be there and you know subtle is good in our field um, you know it's the subtle things that if you take care of those really does help with creating a, a you know a, a really nice piece um, you'll see though, look look how long it's taking to process this now that we've switched our, our motion blur on, you know, and our depth of field really does slow things up, which is why it's good to do this you know, at the end if we can. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's gone a little crazy perhaps on these. Maybe the, uh, maybe the depth of field is a little high. Maybe take that back down to 100. But you could tweak these settings to suit. You, you know, I'm showing you how to do it. Up to you how, uh, how much of a flavor you give this. So now what we're going to do is a little bit of grading. So if we contextually click again and we go across to new adjustment layer, all right, and what we're going to do, in fact, actually for this, let's let's be sensible. Let's switch our motion blur off for the moment. OK, um, inside our adjustment layer, let's get to the end of our scene here, like so. We're going to contextually click again in our effect controls panel and I'm going to scroll down to magic bullet looks. OK, now if you haven't got looks, don't worry, you could do this using levels, curves, tricks like that. But, you know, let's show off what Magic look, a Bullet Looks does, shall we, for the sake of this tutorial. It creates this little dialogue here. Now if we hit edit, like so, what it does, it brings up a separate kind of application uh, which sort of sits 
alongside After Effects. And what you can do, if you just roll over the looks type here, it brings up all of these choices. And what I want to do, as you'll see, I've already selected uh, one of these menus. All you do is you just you know, twirl them open, find one that you like the look of, and you can choose to apply it. And I'm going to choose to apply Subtle Film. There we go. OK, and I'm happy with that. So all we need to do is click on Finish, like so. And I think that's added a really nice feel. It's just kind of gelled it all together. It's reduced the sort of orange saturation of the autumn time. And it's just kind of blended everything together really, really nicely. I'm really happy with the way that looks now. And by the way, if you hit T on your adjustment layer, OK, bring up opacity. You can control, if we scroll that down, yeah, look at that. You've got perfect control over how much of that effect is applied, which is really, really nice. And you, I think, don't, don't you think that that's much nicer? I, I personally do. I think that's fine. I think that actually looks quite nice. I think that's just got a little bit more class about it, all right? I just think that's... And it's such an easy way to, to, to grade that, isn't it? You just open up looks, open up that um, particular preset, and bang, there you go. I think that's a really, really nice way of uh, going about things. And if your client's happy with it, well, you're onto a winner, aren't you? So let's now create our final stage, which is creating a solid. We're going to create a black solid like so, and why don't we uh, name this vignette, because that is what it's going to be. Uh, we'll OK that there. Uh, actually, while we're here, let's rename our adjustment layer as uh, grade, and we'll, we'll even call it looks, so that we know what's going on in there. And with our vignette layer selected, what we're going to do is grab our little pen tool. We're going to just very, very quickly draw out. And it can be rough, this. It really can. It, it, you know, because we're going to really, really feather this out. There we go. Let's create a sort of a mask, kind of like this. That'll do it. Hit M to reveal your mask properties, and we're going to swap that around from being an additive mask to a subtractive, so that what we're left with are these kind of corners here. And what we're going to do is hit F for feather, and let's dial feather up quite a lot. You know, really quite a lot. And now what we can also do just twirl open your mask settings like so, and let's expand the mask until you're happy that we've just got this kind of nice vignette going on. Maybe increase the feathering a little bit more, increase your, 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 your expansion just a little bit more. Now click away. Beautiful. Switch that off to see the difference. I think that's absolutely what we wanted. And I'm really, really happy with that. And I, I hope you are too. I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. Let's do a little preview, shall we? Let's press, uh, let's bring this up to 100%. And if you hit the tilde key on your keypad, what that does is it just uh, concentrates on what you're hovering over inside After Effects. If you were to do that with the timeline, it would just concentrate on the timeline on the uh, project panel, for example. Really nice way to get in and focus on a particular part of your After Effects application. So let's hit the tilde key, and I'm going to hit zero on my keypad, and we're going to have a lovely little render to have a look at, and I'll see you in just a second. OK, guys, so I really hope you've enjoyed this tutorial, and I hope you like the end result. I think we've covered a lot of ground over the last hour regarding the particular menu system, and we've covered some interesting topics, such as using custom particles, lighting, visibility, physics, a whole range of options. But of course, there is much more to be explored. Please bear in mind that this is just one approach of an almost infinite variety, as Particular is a very versatile tool. Once you get your head around the menu system, Particular opens up a whole world of effects. It is well worth learning, honestly. Try playing around with it, dial values in to see what happens, just mess about, have fun. Try to take a logical approach to it as well, if you can. I've tried to demonstrate in this tutorial that the menu system is there to help you. Things are named sensibly, so if you need to adjust the emitter, look under the emitter menu. If you need to adjust the particle size or the life or the color of a particle, then those options are under the particle settings. Now, this might seem like I'm stating the obvious, but really, it took me a while to get around to this structured way of thinking. And once you do, you really start to be able to get results quicker. And when you do make your own version of this project, hopefully you will, or you create your own unique designs or special effects with Particular, I'd love for you to post a link in the comments section below. I'd also love for you to post a comment letting me know what you think of this tutorial. Also, if you have any questions, please fire away and I'll check back when I can. So thanks for watching. My name is Owen Street and I'm pleased to be making this on behalf of Red Giant TV. I hope to see you next time. Thanks, Owen. Great stuff. We hope to have you back again soon to share more of your techniques. As I mentioned earlier, Owen is a motion graphics artist, compositor, and designer, and he works at a company called 422 based in Manchester, England. 
You can find them at 422.tv. Also, you can see more of Owen's work at both www.behance.net forward slash Owen Street and at www.vimeo.com forward slash Owen Street. Don't forget, you can download a free trial version of Trap Code Particular and the entire Trap Code suite at redgiantsoftware.com. And you can get tons of free presets for Red Giant plugins at redgiantpeople.com. Finally, I want to mention that if you're looking to keep up with what we're doing at Red Giant, whether it's a tutorial, a contest, a product release, or whatever, just follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and on our blog. Once again, I'm Marlon Rabinowitz for Red Giant TV. I'll see you next time.